have been told were 70 hopper cars filled with a mineral called Trona came crashing down onto this quiet neighborhood along Duffy Street in San Bernardino, California. Seven houses have been totally destroyed. Firefighters are currently searching through the wreckage to find several residents who are still unaccounted for. We have reports that the NTSB has sent a team of investigators from Washington to look into the cause of this tragedy. An airplane crashes, a train derails, a pipeline explodes, a bridge collapses. When these deadly events occur, teams of highly trained experts respond. Their mission, to find out what happened and why. Crash Files. Also in the news, a major train derailment earlier today in San Bernardino, California. Within hours of the crash, a team of railroad investigators was being put together at the NTSB headquarters in Washington, D.C. I was at the office getting ready to go home, and we got notified of this big train derailment in California. Within a two-hour notice, you got to be on the move. So once you get the notification, then you have to start moving towards the airport at the first flight out. The six-member team left late that afternoon for California. Earlier that same morning, in a neighborhood 60 miles east of Los Angeles, residents along Duffy Street had been busy getting ready for work and for school. At exactly 7.37 a.m., Jasmine Hunter was outside with her mother, waiting for the school bus. I think I was probably about six years old. I was standing right here waiting for the bus stop with my mother, and the train goes by as it usually did, about 7, 7.30. And I started to count the carts that went by the track. I was getting ready to go to work, to drinking coffee with my wife, and we heard a vibration. It got louder and louder, the house started vibrating. That morning, I was doing my laundry. All of a sudden, I hear the noise coming down, a squealing noise. Boom! You know. I even just see the train go by as a blur. We decided to get out. By that time, we could hear the crash, and we got out to the front yard and looked down the street from my house all around the corner. The house was just gone. The first to respond were firemen from San Bernardino Station Number Three. Collision. Initially, the dispatch was a traffic collision involving a train, so we're not really expecting what we saw when we got there. As we got closer, we could see the train car sticking up in the air. It was a very lunar landscape. This white powder was covering everything for a couple of blocks. And there's seven houses that are covered up, and three of them are completely flat. Backup fire, police, and rescue units were summoned immediately. Those on scene began the grim search for survivors. Our first concern was to find any injuries or missing people. One resident told firefighters that two young boys were trapped inside one of the houses. Our initial effort was to go in that house because we knew we had a couple of missing kids. One of the train cars came down on top of it and just busted it up like matchsticks. And the house was completely filled. It was amazing. It was like a suffocating blanket. It's like digging in sand. You push it out of the way and it keeps falling back in on you. So it took quite a while actually to, to locate them. The boys were found in a back bedroom. Unfortunately, it was too late. Yeah, so it's a, you work so hard and you do it. You couldn't have found him any faster, and there was still no way. So. Nine-year-old Jason Thompson and his seven-year-old brother Tyson were in their bedroom getting ready for school when they were suddenly buried by tons of trona and suffocated. At the other end of the block, firefighters were struggling to rescue the train's crew from the lead locomotive.
When their extrication tools proved no match for the engine's thick steel, welding torches were brought in by the railroad. Miraculously, the lead engineer had survived the crash, but both the brakeman and the conductor were found dead. With everyone accounted for, city and railroad officials now awaited the arrival of the NTSB. Stunned neighbors, curious onlookers, and news-hungry reporters crowded into the area. I talked to my neighbor, you know, we, we sat in and looked at these houses. I said, one of these days, one of them trains is not going to come around that corner, you know, because there's a, a big U right there. And it, we do know that the engineer on the trailing unit uh, did uh, issue a mayday call on the radio, picked up from our... And he said that the, the train was uh, running away and uh, unable to control the speed and was traveling at a high rate of speed. Just when rescuers thought the worst was over, a woman told them that her 22-year-old son was still inside one of the crushed homes. So we went to that house, and it was the one that was the flattest. And it was moved off the foundation, and there were five levels of those railroad cars all stacked at various angles on top of where this house had been. And uh, everyone says, oh, man, there's no way anyone could be alive in there. But we're going to do whatever we can, you know. Don't give up. So a gentleman walked up to me, and he says, I work for the railroad. I have two 100-ton cranes parked out there on Highland Avenue. Can they be of use? I says, oh, man, how opportune. Using the cranes to stabilize the wreckage, rescuers began digging down into what remained of the house. What we're going to have to do is put in the motor and they're going to have the moving crane in uh, as part of the rescue operation. Hours later, as the sun fell, they were still digging. We had to go through and methodically take everything apart. If we had rushed, could have crushed him. So a time period was just slow process, using your hands to pull sand out of the way in order to locate him. As the hours ticked by, the chances of finding anyone alive began to dim. One of our people that was digging in the area noticed his hand moving. We were all just jazzed to locate him. Oh, they're bringing him out right now. They're bringing Chris Shaw out. The people here are applauding yeah everybody had a big cheer you know it was just absolutely amazing turns out at the time he was taking a shower when this went down and the house just came down around him but he was covered by a bathtub uh, which created an air pocket for him and so he was still alive did you just now talk to him yes right now and, and what he did he said, say i told him that his mama was outside and i was right here for him and he said okay that's all he said he nodded his head okay yeah. Yeah. Tell us again. Right on. Tell us again. by then the ntsb team had arrived i'd seen some pretty bad ones but this was at least as bad as any that i'd ever seen The next morning, in the light of day, the members of the NTSB investigating team began the slow task of searching for clues. I did a walk around to look at the action site to make sure I had a good picture in my own mind of what it looked like. So there was a few things that started to pique my interest, and it was wheels. Whenever I found wheels from freight cars, they were burned up. And they were still hot to touch, even the hours after after the accident occurred. Right away, uh, there was that suspicion that uh, the brakes had failed on this train. But they were cautious not to be swayed by their initial suspicions. A cardinal rule of NTSB investigations is that every possibility be considered. We just won't speculate because you don't want to make the error of saying something and you have to go back and say, no, we weren't right. What we do is look at everything with the idea that it could be any one of these. It could be a mechanical, it could be a train operations, it could be a track condition, it could be human performance. And what we want to do is rule those out if we can and to pinpoint exactly what it was that occurred. The 
first part of the investigation is what I call the, uh, the Jack Webb or the Joe Friday stage of the investigation. Just the facts, ma'am. One key fact was that the train that derailed on Duffy Street was coming down from the top of the Cajon Pass. One of the few passable routes through the rugged San Bernardino Mountains, the Cajon Pass is a gateway to the massive metropolis of Los Angeles and one of the busiest mountain passes in America. Among railroaders, it is legendary as one of the steepest stretches of track in the country. In 16 miles, the track drops nearly 3,000 feet. To maintain control during this descent, trains are required to limit their speed to between 20 and 30 miles per hour, depending on their weight. The curve in the tracks at Duffy Street was designed to handle a maximum speed of 40 miles an hour. When the lead locomotive of the derailed train hit this curve, it came off the tracks and hurled 600 feet before stopping. To find out why, investigators wanted to know how fast it was going when it left the tracks. One of the key things that we were able to get right away was the event recorder tape. Similar to an airplane's flight data recorder, a locomotive event recorder keeps a record of throttle settings, brake applications, and speed. We sent them off to Washington right away, and they printed them out, and they sent them back to us. The locomotive speedometer maxed out at 90 miles an hour. The event recorder showed that when the derailed train left the track, it was traveling at 110. What made this train go so disastrously out of control? Why wasn't the crew able to slow it down? Obviously, we had a runaway. And the thing that we're trying to figure out was the braking system working. Uh, was there some kind of a failure on the engineer's part? To get answers, investigators went to the company that owned and operated the train, Southern Pacific Railroad. One of the things we'll ask the railroad is, give us the background of this train. Where does this train come from? How has it come about? What's, what's the history of this train? A train's history can be found in its profile, a printout given to the engineer listing the type and weight of each of its cars. The profile of the train that derailed on Duffy Street showed that it was pulling 69 hopper cars, each designed to hold over 200,000 pounds, 100 tons. But according to the profile, each of them held only 60 tons. That would have meant that they were half loaded. And we said, no, no, that don't sound right. The shipper's not going to ship half of the capacity of the car when he can load it up to 100 tons. To confirm the weight numbers, the NTSB went to the company that had contracted for and loaded the cars, Lake Minerals Mining. They learned that all 69 cars carried the same thing, sodium carbonate, better known as trona. Used most commonly to make glass, trona is a crystal deposit found on the surface of dry lake beds in the central California desert. Mining it involves simply scraping it from the lake bed and crushing it into a fine powder. Well, they were very curious about how we loaded the cars and what weight we had in the cars. I asked him, I said, how much weight was in these cars? He said, 100 tons. I said, how do you know? And he told me about this process that they had used to weigh the cars. It turned out that Lake Minerals learned how to load hopper cars the hard way. McClung told them about an incident that had happened two months earlier in the port of Los Angeles. Lake Minerals had sent a trainload of Trona to be loaded aboard a freighter for delivery to a customer in South America. Southern Pacific provided the 100-ton hopper cars. Being new to shipping by rail, Lake Minerals lacked a loading facility and hence a scale. To calculate how much Trona to load into each car, they did the math calculating how many square feet of trona it took to equal a hundred tons. And then we loaded the cars to a certain level and decided that that was the proper level to have the tonnage in the cars. After the ship was filled, they discovered that their math was wrong. Once it was loaded on the ship, then the ship 
does a survey of the draft of the ship and they determine the tonnage that you've loaded and that's when we came up short by several hundred tons. So at that time there was nothing to do but to release the ship with less tons on it than what we'd contracted for. As it turned out, we ended up paying for that tonnage that we did not have on the vessel. It was in the neighborhood of twenty or thirty thousand dollars that we had to pay for dead freight. For a small company like Lake Minerals, it was an expensive mistake, and one they were not about to make again when, two months later, they got a second order from the same customer. The second order was for 6,900 tons, and that's why we ordered 69 cars from the railroad. This time, the fact that we were short tonnage on the first one, we decided to take other measures to assure that we had the proper tonnage the shipper put a device on the front end loader that was loading the cars of Trona, and the device would give the, uh, the operator uh, a known weight, and that was recorded as the cars were loaded, and so he would ensure that he had 100 tons in the car. We were very confident that they were accurate to 100 tons. Why then did the profile state that each car only held 60 tons? So we went back and said, how do these weights get reported and recorded? The first record of the train's weight was a document known as the Bill of Lading, which recorded the ID number and weight of each individual hopper car. The Bill of Lading had come from a railroad yard in Mojave, California, where the loaded cars were taken to be joined up with engines. When McClung finished overseeing the loading process, he delivered the Bill of Lading to the clerk in the yard office. We told him that we had our 69 cars loaded, that they were 100-ton cars, and he did not ask for weights, nor did we give him weights at that particular time. It was his understanding that he had ordered 100-ton cars so the railroad would have known that they had 100 tons in each car. So he didn't give him any weights, and he leaves, and the clerk there at the yard office realizes that he doesn't have weight. So he calls that mineral company, and he doesn't get anybody, it's a, I don't know what it was, a Saturday or something. And he knows that the computer in Los Angeles is going to need a weight. He knew from experience what 100 tons of coal looked like and assumed Trona weighed considerably less. So he turned around and put 60 tons in each of the cars. He just guessed at that. And he thought that it would be changed in Los Angeles when it got to the billing department. The bill of lading was faxed to the accounting department at Southern Pacific's main office in Los Angeles. Because the weight was not marked as an estimate, the billing clerk did not double check it when it was entered into the train's profile. Back at the Mojave Yard, the profile was passed on to the three-person crew, who had no reason to doubt that the weights it contained were true. They didn't know it, but that train weighed 40% more than what they thought it did. Investigators also wanted to know about the condition of the train's brakes. The primary brakes on a train are called air or pneumatic brakes. Each car is linked by an air hose that controls brake pads on each individual wheel. From the event recorder, we could see that he had done an initial terminal air brake test, which is required, and there had been a train inspection. Things appeared to be working as expected. These locomotives were also equipped with a second braking system called dynamic brakes. Easiest way probably to explain it is like downshifting on a car. They're using the engines on the train to slow up the train. The lead engineer, who survived the accident, told investigators that he knew the dynamic brakes on one of his three lead engines were not working. But given the weight of the train stated in the profile, he felt that he had more than enough braking power. The train proceeded south to the base of the Cajon Pass, where two helper engines were attached to the rear. If you have only a short area where the train needs to go uphill for a short distance, it needs some extra help, so they'll assign what they call helpers. Yet again, a critical piece of information got lost. We found out one of the helper locomotive units had a non-functioning dynamic braking system. But nobody told the lead engineer. The engineer on the rear end never radioed to tell him that he didn't have dynamics on that second unit. He thought that the dispatcher 
knew it, and he would have told them. We checked the dispatchers, and they had no way to record that. They didn't record that on their sheets or anything, so they wouldn't have known either. Just after dawn on the morning of May 12, 1989, the train, two of its five engines with no brakes, and pulling 40% more weight than was reported to its engineer, began its ascent of the Cajon Pass. So he's got three locomotives on the head end and two on the rear that are, are working as hard as they can go to get him up that grade. It's not like the seat of your pants like you and I are driving. You kind of get a feel for how the road feels. He doesn't get that. An engineer has to anticipate what he's going to do because if he waits, it's too late. The pass crests at 3,800 feet. To control their descent, trains must cross the summit at or below a maximum authorized speed. The maximum authorized speed is going to determine at what point he cannot control the train any longer, the point of no return. To calculate that speed, the engineer needs to know two things. How heavy is the train and how many brakes does it have? Not realizing his numbers were wrong, the engineer calculated his maximum speed to be 30 miles per hour. In fact, he should have been going no faster than 20. As the train began to move down the curved track at the top of the mountain, that small difference would turn a controlled descent into a runaway train. He was able to control the speed to around about 30 miles an hour through those curves, so he thought he had it pretty well under control. But when the curves ended and the train hit the straightaway, it began to pick up speed. Now he found himself having to continually in order to check the speed of the train, add more and more pressure, add more and more pneumatic brakes. The brake shoes are coming against the wheels, and that's going to retard the motion of the train and start to slow it down. It's also doing something else. It's also slowly creating friction, uh, and that friction is making heat. Concerned that the brakes were not slowing the train, the lead engineer radioed to the engineer in the rear helper locomotive. He called to his helper engineer and you're giving me the maximum dynamics and he replied yes which was a true statement he didn't understand that one unit wasn't providing any the helper engineer became alarmed that the train was picking up so much speed now he can see on his brake gauges that the engineer was making every attempt to control the train but nothing was happening he went ahead and made the decision to place the train brakes in emergency what he didn't realize was that throwing the emergency brakes shut off the dynamic brakes. The helper engineer stated that after that he placed the brakes in emergency, he felt the train surge, and that little surge was the loss of dynamic braking. And then it just skyrocketed. It just surged forward. The heat generation in this accident was so excessive, you actually got friction welding going on. It actually begins to heat so much that the steel on the wheel tread actually goes molten and starts to lubricated. At that point, you're literally being shoved down a mountain by thousands of tons that are out of control, and you're in for a ride. At that moment, Joe Suarez was inside his trackside cafe eating breakfast. The first thing that we noticed was the ground was shaking. And when we came out, that's when we saw the train. But you knew immediately something was wrong because of all the smoke and, and, and the noise that it was making as it's coming down. All the engineer could do now was warn any trains on the track ahead. We have a slight problem. I don't know if we can get the train stopped. The helper engineer could hear this over his radio and didn't feel that it was conveying the seriousness of the situation. So he gets on there, he hollers, mayday, mayday, and then he starts giving up the speed of the train. 60, 70, 80, 90. By the time he gets to that 40 mile an hour curve, he's going 110. The NTSB concluded that the disaster was caused by two critical mistakes. The failure to determine and communicate the weight of the train 
and the failure to communicate the condition of the train's brakes. Two boys and two of the train's crew were dead. Seven families were homeless. Another 27 families were evacuated until a full extent of the damage could be assessed. Little did anyone realize that their nightmare was only just beginning. Within hours of the derailment, another group descended on Duffy Street. Lawyers, including a savvy L.A. attorney named James Davis. He and his wife ended up out there in Duffy Street and sort of mixed and mingled with the crowd, and pretty soon uh, he was representing over 200 victims. I thought that he, he was so very concerned about what, what was going on with the uh, people. So people trusted him. He said he was up in the air while this whole thing happened in the airplane, shooting, taking pictures, and he did. He showed us a lot of pictures and all that, and we thought, oh, everything will be going on great. He was representing to them that the, their cases and their claims were worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Another group on scene that day were officials from the CalNev Pipeline Company. Their concern was a pipeline that lay directly beneath where the train had landed. Buried six feet underground, the 14-inch pipe carried over three million gallons of gasoline per day. It transported the fuel from CalNev storage facility near San Bernardino over the Cajon Pass to Las Vegas, Nevada, 250 miles away. Though the pumps were shut down after the derailment, the pipe still contained thousands of barrels of gasoline under high pressure. Fire and city officials were worried that a slight leak could trigger a massive explosion. When I was called out to the site, it was because they were worried that the pipeline might start leaking fuel and that that fuel might ignite. They wanted to channel it away from the houses and into an empty field where they could contain it. And they had the crash truck from Norton Air Force Base there to spread foam on it in the event that it did start leaking. But when the pressure in the pipeline held steady, concern that it had been ruptured by the crash began to ease. In the days that followed, construction cranes were brought in to remove the tons of wreckage and CalNev officials stood by to ensure that the pipeline remained unharmed. I instructed CalNev that they had to have people on site to monitor the activity so that we didn't do anything uh, to uh, break that pipeline. The pipeline company had performed quite well in preventing the railroad from dragging the cars and the locomotives across its pipe. They had gone out early on, they had uh, located their pipe, they had marked uh, its location on the ground. They dug down and inspected the pipe by hand a couple of places to make sure that it was intact and not damaged, and those came back positive that it was uh, in good shape. Despite these precautions, concern among residents remained high. Everybody was saying, there is a time bomb, and I didn't even understand. So I asked my neighbor, what do you guys mean by time bomb? They said, if the gas is explode, it will be a big one. Everybody had it in the back of their mind that it was you know, a possibility for a problem. But we were under the understanding that the company who owned it would, you know, be checking it out and making sure it was safe. City Attorney Penman filed court papers demanding that CalNev dig up and inspect the entire length of pipeline, not just a few sections, before it was reopened. It seems to me that somebody should have taken it upon themselves to dig up the pipeline. Uh, the pipeline company, or the railroad, maybe, I don't know. I would have thought the pipeline company would want to make sure their pipeline was safe. The request was heatedly contested by CalNev, who argued that the city had no jurisdiction over the pipeline. Though pipelines are officially regulated by the Federal Office of Pipeline Safety and overseen by state fire marshals, in practice, decisions about pipeline safety are usually left in the hands of the pipeline companies themselves. Though the NTSB was in charge of the investigation, it had no authority to make decisions about the pipeline. That's the problem with the State Fire Marshal and the Office of Pipeline Safety. If the safety board got involved in that, and if the actions taken were not adequate, who's going to investigate the accident? Four days after the derailment, CalNev officials declared that the pipeline was safe and, on its own authority, reopened it. The one thing that was clear 
in every law we read and every court we went to was the city of San Bernardino had absolutely no authority, had absolutely no say in any of this. On the morning of Thursday, May 25th, 13 days after the derailment, the cleanup operation had been completed and the track restored to full service. The NTSB team, having finished the on-site phase of their investigation, had returned to Washington to prepare their report. On Duffy Street, life was back to something resembling normal. Jasmine Hunter, who was six at the time, remembers waking up that morning with a bad dream and not wanting to go to school. The night before, I had a bad dream. I tried to my mom, um, not to make me go to school because something was going to happen. But she was late for work, and she made me get on the bus. Ten-year-old Roy Lociali was two blocks away. We were just standing there playing around. I went for the school bus, and then all of a sudden, we all looked up, and we hear something just spraying like a hairspray can. Residents stated that they thought it was raining. One gentleman said, yeah, we were in the kitchen and water was dripping off the eaves and we looked out the window and it's raining. And I went up to the front door and it's running off the eaves there, it's raining there, but he says, I started smelling gasoline. And he says, man, that isn't right. And I thought it was a firecracker. And so when I stepped forward and I'm looking up at this flame and balls of fire just going everywhere, I feel the heat as I'm starting to burn. And I grab my scooter, I try to go, but it was so hot out there, it felt like I wasn't moving nowhere. So I just threw my scooter right there and started running. I remember as I was running down the street, I seen this fireball just miss my head. And then landed right here in the field and started burning. At 8.07 a.m., a geyser of gasoline shooting out from the burst pipeline exploded. A mile away, Jasmine Hunter could see the flames from her school bus window. We were about 15 minutes away. And the, everything started shaking and we saw the flames coming up. We got the dispatch for a large fire, but when we opened the doors, we could see immediately what it was. You could see it plainly from where we were, about a mile and a half away from it. My mom was walking out to her car. She saw all this fumes coming up, and she went back in the house to tell my uncle and got knocked from the door back into the sidewalk. She's in the house, I think, for like a day or two. The fuel had sprayed across the street onto the houses on the other side of the street, which weren't involved in the derailment, and completely covered them. And uh, they were all on fire. There was so much pressure and so much fuel coming up out of there that a helicopter pilot later on told us that he was at a thousand feet and could see flames right at his eye level. Boiling black smoke with orange red balls of fire just moving through it. It was intimidating. You, uh, you had to have a heavy coat and your helmet on to stand outside a block away just to tolerate the radiant heat. We got too close initially and it melted the plastic lenses on the front of the fire engine. A second tragedy hit this morning in the same San Bernardino neighborhood where only two weeks ago, a runaway train killed four people. We were having and walking on the way back, my beeper went off. Someone said, wouldn't it be a shame if the pipeline had ruptured? Back on Duffy Street, the fire had destroyed 11 homes and damaged five others. Two residents, an elderly woman and a young mother of two, were dead. 31 others were injured. This woman came to the shelter after being treated and released from a local hospital. She was burned while trying to pull her children from the van after the fire began. Then my mom saw that we were capping the van and she came running and she was and she was burning and she opened the door and then we got out, we got out and we just ran. 165 families were evacuated, many vowing never to return. It almost knocked it down when it hit, you know, the explosion when it went off. And it's, at this time, I think I'm out of here. <laughs> You're leaving? I've got to do something. It's, it's too close, too time. By late afternoon, while firefighters were still working to control the last of the blaze, the NTSB team returned to Duffy Street. 
It looked like chaos. It hit the area. Houses damaged, destroyed, and burned. Really looked rough. The investigation began several miles from the accident site at CalNev's pipeline control room. Control room is a room with computers bringing in information about what's happening along the pipeline, the pressure at various points, the flow. They wanted to know what was going on inside the pipeline when it burst. What they found was a potentially disastrous mistake. Your computers have a historical record of what happened before this rupture occurred. So we could see what happened when the first alarm came in. When the pipe burst, an alarm sensed the drop in pressure and automatically shut the system down. But when the operator on duty saw the pressure dropping, he assumed that it only meant the pumps had shut off, and so he restarted them. Again, the system shut down, and again he tried to restart it. He did this three times. Finally, the whole thing shut down. And then he's still wondering what's going on when he gets a call from San Bernardino and says, there's a fire over here. Is this involving your pipeline? They looked out the window and there was this big fire. The day following the fire, investigators unearthed the section of pipe that had burst open. The pipe was there with a big gaping hole that uh, was bigger in the middle and tapered to both sides, sort of look, almost like a big pair of lips opened up. What they call a fish mouth opening. I guess it was probably gaped open six to eight inches at the midpoint where the product was really flowing out of it. We unearthed the pipeline and saw it had not one, but multiple scrapes on it. We took the section of the pipeline and cut it out. We cut it up into parts that we could ship back to D.C. People in our metals lab took it, did their thing with it to determine how it failed. We also had them look to see if they could tell anything about the direction in which the damage had been made to the pipe. Finding out the direction in which the scrapes had been made would provide a subtle but important clue for determining what caused them. To do that, the scrapes were examined in a scanning electron microscope for evidence of deformity in the minute grains of metal. Well, they were able to look at the grains and tell us that the grains were deformed and that had to be caused by a hardened device being scraped across the pipe in a direction from south to north. Armed with this clue, investigators next tried to pinpoint which piece of equipment had been working in a south to north direction near the pipeline. We interviewed all of the operators we could get a hold of down there, as well as we interviewed people who observed their operations. We established through those interviews who was working where, doing what, and in what directions. And the only ones we could find that were going back and forth was doing a tronal removal. They were going in, picking it up, and loading it out. And they were dragging it back and forth. We narrowed it down to one piece of equipment. That was the piece of equipment that was cleaning the trona, uh, one of the last pieces of equipment working out there. After being hit by a 100,000-ton train and then carefully avoided by an army of heavy equipment, it turned out the pipe had been damaged by a bucket attached to an ordinary backhoe. Those teeth matched very nicely the width of the gouges. The thing, I think, that slipped up on everybody was once the heavy equipment had been moved, the cars and the trains and so forth, now you're kind of a cleanup operation. And we have a front end loader that's going in and picking up something. Every time they picked up something, they would pick up six or eight inches of dirt. And after this repeated itself over a period of time, they had actually taken the elevation of the land down three to four feet deep. A pipe that was once six feet underground was now only three feet. And this raised a new question. Why hadn't the gouges been discovered before the pipeline was reopened? If they had uncovered the pipeline and did a visual inspection, they would have observed what I was told were the indentations in the, uh, in the pipe, or they would have, they would have discovered the, the point of contact between the heavy piece of equipment and the pipeline. 
They did a lot of spot excavations over areas where the potential for damage was, and they didn't find any evidence that the train parts had buried deeply enough into the ground to affect the pipeline. So they felt fairly confident that nothing had happened to the pipeline. I think from what we detected from interviewing the people out there was they felt they had done a good enough job of oversight. They had no concern the pipeline had been damaged. So they did nothing else. One option that hadn't been tried was something called a smart pig. A smart pig is essentially a pipe inspecting robot. It travels inside the pipe using a magnetic field to detect changes in wall thickness. When it senses a problem, it stops and signals a monitor on the surface. A smart pig would have found the gouge. But to do that, it would have had to travel the entire 250 mile length of the pipe. The inspection device would have been entered in San Bernardino and the first place it could have been taken out would be Las Vegas, which would have taken many days to get there. Plus you'd have to have the pipeline operating under pressure, uh, flowing product, and that's what you don't want to do until you find out your pipeline's sound. Even though the pumps had been shut off, the pipeline was still filled with gasoline. As a precaution, the day of the derailment, Kalnov began draining this gasoline into tanker trucks, hoping to close a check valve located at the base of the Cajon Pass. A check valve is a safety device located inside the pipeline. When liquid flows in the wrong direction, it forces the check valve to close. What they were trying to do was empty the section of pipe below Duffy Street. But as they kept draining gasoline out, the pressure in the pipeline stayed the same, meaning that for some unknown reason, the check valve wasn't closing. They thought potentially they were not pulling product out fast enough to cause the check valve to seal. So they tried it again and tried to pull out product faster. This didn't work either. They gave up. Nobody ever did anything to check and see if the check valve had function, whether it might be a problem. There was no inspection made of them after that. They just assumed that the removal of material wasn't fast enough to cause them to close. The day of the explosion, they discovered that they were wrong. As gasoline began rushing back down the mountain towards the break, the check valve should have stopped it. It didn't. The check valve not closing allowed all the product all the way up to the top of Cahoon Pass to flow backwards toward the rupture and dump thousands and thousands and thousands of gallons into the area that otherwise would not have been uh, involved in the accident. The fire burned out of control for over eight hours. Only after the explosion was the check valve finally inspected and found to be jammed in the open position. It was very frustrating and it was very painful. And I don't like to recall what happened. It's the first time I've talked about this in years, and I'm surprised that it's still, I still feel a little emotion when I do talk about it. It just, it was just, there was just no reason for those people to die. Absolutely no reason. And somebody didn't do their job. After the explosion, Penman demanded that the pipeline be relocated to a dry wash on the opposite side of the tracks. The safest place for that pipeline is on the other side of the railroad track instead of the same side as the houses. Not being an engineer, I didn't know if that was feasible, but we were never told that it wasn't feasible. We were just told we're not going to do it. Once again, Penman took his case to court, this time demanding that the pipe be moved. Once again, he failed. In the days that followed the explosion, federal officials finally stepped in to oversee the repair and replacement of the damaged pipeline. The Office of Pipeline Safety issued a order requiring the pipeline to be fully exposed throughout the derailment area and ordered it to be tested before it could be put back in service. Two weeks after the explosion, the pipeline was restored to full service in its existing location. For the NTSB, this situation was a disturbing reminder of a wider problem. In the United States alone, there are over two million miles of underground liquid and natural gas pipelines. In the last decade, pipeline accidents have killed 226 people and caused $700 million in property damage. 
In Bellingham, Washington, two young boys died when they lit a big lighter near a stream behind their house. A young man who was fishing a mile away was also killed by the fireball. No one in the neighborhood knew the pipeline was there until it exploded. In Carlsbad, New Mexico, 12 members of a family, including five children, were killed when a natural gas pipeline ruptured and ignited, leaving an 86-foot-long crater. Both cases are currently under investigation by the NTSB. The public doesn't really know the hazards of pipelines. These pipelines have been laying in the ground from 40 to 60 years or more. They have experienced corrosion in some locations. Uh, they have experienced uh, external damage uh, from excavation activities. These carry a lot of energy, a lot of pressure, and they can do a lot of harm in a very short period of time. In response to NTSB recommendations, legislation is now before Congress that would require major pipelines to be inspected on a regular basis. NTSB Chairman Jim Hall. The Federal Office of Pipeline Safety has failed the American people in doing their job. And I'm very pleased to see that legislation is moving through now. The bad part of that is that it took the accident in Bellingham, Washington, where those three young people so tragically died. The NTSB released its final report in June 1990. Since then, several of its recommendations have changed the way trains and pipelines operate. 100-ton hopper cars are now automatically assumed to contain 100 tons. Engineers and dispatchers are made aware of any and all mechanical problems with their engines. Pipeline alarms have been improved and operators better trained in how to respond to them. Many localities around the country have changed zoning laws to prevent homes from being built too close to either railroads or pipelines. In the years that followed the double disasters of May 1989, many residents on Duffy Street experienced a third disaster. While a handful of the legal claims settled independently, the majority of the residents still remained banded together as a group, represented by attorney James Davis. We are going into court to get a proper compensation and a proper redress so that this kind of thing can't happen again. I thank you for allowing me to do this job. I'll do the best I can. Thank you. Despite Davis's outward optimism, as the years went by, the case dragged on unresolved. In 1996, seven years into the case, Davis gathered his clients outside the San Bernardino County Courthouse and announced that he had reached an agreement to settle all 200 claims for a mere $2 million, the bulk of which was used to pay off Davis's bank loans and consulting fees. In the end, the 200 residents he represented received little or nothing. Soon after, Davis declared bankruptcy and withdrew from the case. We got screwed from start to finish. He cheated everybody. I hate people like that. He was in financial trouble. He was being investigated by, as I understand, the state bar. He was on his way down, and he figured he would get a quick and easy settlement. This is a travesty of justice. I've been doing this for 21 years. I've never seen a case like this, and if you can point to another case that's anywhere similar to this, I would be surprised. These people have got nothing but headaches. The block of Duffy Street where the houses were destroyed remains a vacant lot. No memorial has been erected. A promise by the city to develop the area as a park was quietly forgotten. Many of the residents who once lived here have moved on. The train tracks and the pipeline remain.